Hi everyone, Charles from The Food People here. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome one of the hottest chefs in the UK right now, Paul Ainsworth. Paul joins me today to talk about what motivates him and why, how the team are at the core of all that they do at Paul Ainsworth restaurants, his culinary inspiration, the rich and diverse bounty of Cornwall, and I'm sure a raft of other topics. So welcome, Paul, and thank you for joining me for the second time um, today as part of the Food people in conversation with. At the Food People we're very clear about why we do what we do. We're champions of change driven every day by our intent to shift the future of food and drink by harnessing the power of trends and this in conversation with series is all about talking to other people, brands, businesses, entrepreneurs to find out more about why they do what they do how in their way they're championing change and shifting the future of food and drink. And that's what this series is all about. Paul, it is brilliant to be speaking to you today uh, once again. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Charles. Lovely to be back. No worries. Um, well, since we last spoke in November, kind of a lot's happened. You've moved um, up the tiers and now we're in a full national lockdown. How have the last few months been really for you? Well, you know, the last few months have been, you know, good, you know, in, in a nutshell. We, if we sort of go back to July 4th, coming out of lockdown one, um, you know, anyone in Cornwall that wasn't busy, um, you know, should should sort of, you know, have a bit of a look at their business, really, because we, as a, as a county, we just got absolutely, you know, awash with people coming down and, you know, generally in a good mood and wanting to sort of, you know, spend their money in the county. And, you know, that was brilliant for all businesses and everybody, not just businesses, but employment and the whole sort of, you know, economy for Cornwall was thriving. Yeah. Uh, then we go into lockdown in November. You know, that was more of a break, I, I, I suppose, Charles. Wow. It was, you know, we shut the businesses for a month. The teams were very, very sort of tired after a very, very busy summer. Yeah. You know, one of our busiest on record. Wow. Um, then I suppose if we go now to this third lockdown, yeah, that was a bit more difficult to, to, to manage. We had nine hours notice. The announcement was made at half past three in the afternoon on the 30th. Yeah. Um, as you can imagine we were geared up for the new year absolutely and what a lot of people you know probably don't know is that the fishermen don't um fish over christmas mm -hmm. so you you essentially stockpile and get your stock in and you know make sure you've got plenty of stock because a lot of our suppliers shut for christmas yeah but christmas um post boxing day is a very busy time in um, padstow and north yeah. cornwall so yeah that was um that was kind of a bit of a Right, what do we do here? But as as ever, a fantastic team. After we finished service on the 30th, we had an emergency meeting in this room and we thought, right, what do we do? So we made these food hampers so people yeah. could have this kind of really amazing number six experience in their home. We yeah. cooked everything. All you had to do was warm it up and yeah. you could have a gorgeous experience in your home on New Year's Eve. And then we ran the rest of the stock out um, in takeaways um, uh -huh. at Cafe Reggiano and the Mariners. So, you know, in those situations, it's about, you know, improvising, you know, adapt and overcome. And that's what we, that's literally the three words that I always put to, right, what are we going to do with this situation? Um, then we closed. Uh, and then as ever, I, um, I, my, my focus is always, and the most important part of the whole of this is the team. Yeah. They're making them feel secure, reassured, safe, and, you know, keeping an eye on things like mental health and, you know, those that are on their own, yeah. uh, that might be kind of, you know, you know, just in a, just in a, a bed sit, you yeah. know, like that, that are, you know, like I was when I was their age, you know, of kind of, living in living in sort of you know staff quarters or you know renting a bed sit out and stuff so you know that, that can be really really tough really tough uh it can be very lonely yeah definitely and i'm imagining that at that at that point when that happened that you literally had you know, walking fridges and larders just teeming teeming with uh ingredients and produce and so on ready to I took to to roll out across the remainder of the festive period. Did you manage to run everything out across the different outlets that you that you had? Yeah, um, as, as as best we could. We yeah. like to say we came up with a plan, and you know, I then put a huge 
huge hit to social media. You know, yeah. I was recording videos. You may have seen it. I was doing video okay. after video. I was doing yeah. post after post, just showing people, look, come and get this. It's absolutely amazing. It's super delicious. Come in, you know, come and um, have it. And, and people responded. So the response to it was, was phenomenal. Um, and then, you know, you know, some of it, you know, like you can freeze. So things like, you know, things like that are non, you know, non-perishable are fine. Um, yeah. but yeah, we, we, we did the best we could with the situation that, you know, that we had. And, and that's, that's what it's about. It's about minimizing that food waste as yeah. best you can yeah. rather than just saying, Oh, we shut us. And well, you yeah. know, look, what, what can we do? And is, yeah. the, is the work for some of them, Paul? Um, are, you know, are you are you are you running? Have you chosen to run kind of takeaway, or or have you or have you closed completely? We 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 did take away on in lockdown one more 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 so just to do something. Yeah. Um, when you when you take everything away from it, Charles, it's just it's it's completely and utterly not worth doing for yeah. us. Yeah. And what makes it not worth doing for us is we are. I've said this, and you know, and I'm probably repeating myself from the first one. You know, if you if you're not in business, the easiest way to look at what this is and what this whole um, crisis means to a business is is your own personal outgoings in life. Probably your rent or your mortgage is your biggest outgoing in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in business, your wages, your staff, your, that's your biggest outgoing. Yeah. And that is kind of taken care of, or a lot of it is taken care of by furlough. But you've still got all your other you've still got all your other expenses. Yeah. So in your normal domestic life, your mobile phone, your council tax, your, your yeah. water bill, so on and so on. But that's the same in, in, in business. I've still got many, many more outgoings, but with no income. Yeah. No income whatsoever. So to then go and do takeaway and it costs me money. Yeah. It's yeah. just yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. It's 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 ridiculous. And you can't, there's only a certain price I feel comfortable in charging for takeaway. Yeah. If I then do a lesser job, people are going to be like, well, I had, I had a Paul Ainsworth takeaway and I didn't think much of yeah. it. Yeah. Or it was crap um, because I'm trying to do it too cheap to, you know, to sort of yeah, please yeah. that sort of accessibility yeah. side of it. Um, and then you kind of run the risk of, you know, I think especially this time, the, the the sort of transmission rate in Cornwall is yeah. definitely up much, much from higher. where it is much, much higher from yeah. where it was in lockdown one and lockdown two. So if you think about all of those things, it's like, do you know what? You're we're better off just staying closed, um, working behind the scenes on Zoom and Teams and yeah. staying motivated that way, yeah. coming up with new ideas. And just the positive I look at it is just having this unbelievable um, unbelievable amount of time yeah. that we'll never ever ever get again touch yeah. woods we hope we never get it again to hone and polish and refine every single detail yeah. of your business yeah, yeah. bro when we last spoke you talked about your passion for hospitality and where the seeds of that came from um from your parents but between that point and where you are now, you've worked with some incredible chefs. I just want to ask you, you know, who are those that have influenced you most and yeah, how have they done that and, and what some of those things mean to you now in what you do? Yeah, uh, like, like every, every chef, you know, there's a chef that people will have heard of and there's a chef that people won't have heard of. You know, my, my background goes right back to, you know, my first sort of chefs when I started at a little hotel in Southampton, yeah. hugely influenced me. They were great within their own right. You know, it, like I've always, I think I've said to you before, you know, it does start with my upbringing. You know, I had, I had an incredible dad that was, that was, a, you know, a stickler for, for hard work from a very early, very, very early age. Sometimes yeah. people look at you and I don't know if they believe you, but I, he, he had me, you know, working hard from an early age and understanding the value of money. And that if I wanted something, I had to earn it. Yeah. And then when you get a bit older and then you start to want things like trainers and clothes and they're the most important <laughs> things in your life, you've got yeah. this mentality of like, well, if I want those brand spanking new Nike Air Max, I've got to, I've got to go through a process to get there. I can't yeah. just ask for them. 
So then, you know, moving on to sort of Carey's Manor in the New Forest, I had two amazing chefs, um, you know, a guy called Graham Senior and a, and a guy called Kevin Dorrington, who I look back on. And again, they were so disciplined and very, very strict that it wasn't just playtime and, and all of that. Like, it, there was a great work ethic there. Yeah. And then I moved on, moved to London where I then worked for a chef that people have heard of and known, that was Gary Rhodes. Um, yeah. And again, that was where I probably then got my first real understanding of food and what went with what and why it went with that. Yeah, okay. And, and to start to really understand flavour. And that's because I was getting older and I was by now I'm sort of 17 years old and I'm getting this kind of understanding of how things work. And then after that was, um, you know, a huge giant leap into going to work for Gordon Ramsay, um, but no one knew who Gordon was outside of catering. Yeah. You know, Gordon wasn't in the public eye. So to sort of start with Gordon in sort of 1999 and, you know, something I didn't realise, you, you know, when you're there, but you look back on now and start there as a two-star. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, you know, over a year later, it wins three stars. Yeah, was was just was just unbelievable at the time. Was that the Hospital that, Road, Paul? Was it Hospital Road? Yeah. yeah. But now I look back on it and think, I go. You know, certainly now the last four years, Michelin have opened have opened up the doors to allow you to come and it be more of a ceremony than finding out either online or yeah. before online when the book was released. Um, and I think it was the first time that it that it happened. There was always there was all these rumours about three stars, three stars, three stars. And then you actually realise, yeah, like when was the last three star? And I think the like the last one was like Alan Ducasse yeah. at that time. And you then sort of it dawns on you that like, yeah, a f to be a part of to be a part of that, not many chefs will sort of ever experience that of being in a being in a team that like wins the ultimate accolade, you know, like the, the ultimate, ultimate accolade of, you know, of, of cooking three stars. And you, you look back on that now and the team that was there and 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 just it, it sticks out in my memory so clearly. Like, you know, we had three, we had a mission and inspection in the January, and then Gordon came into the kitchen the night before it was going to be announced. Uh, and they told Gordon the night before. Yeah. And they had dinner. Gordon went out with him. He was out there with them for ages. And then we're all in service. And he comes back in. We finish service. He gets us all around the pass and says, guys, Royal Hospital Road is now three Michelin stars. <laughs> and even telling you now, like the hair stand Yeah, I know. Well, it's just done that to me as well. Now. And I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. And... He then, you know, clearly said, you know, like you, you know, he obviously thanked us all. He obviously told us, like, you know, what we've, what what that means to 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 him and and us, and now what that means moving forward. Um, new people coming into the team, just just everything. And then obviously the next day it was announced, and the, you know, and the frenzy. Um, and then he he sort of took us took us a few weeks later we had a big party at the intercontinental hotel in london because when he when his football career didn't um go to plan with injuries that was the first place he chefed yeah okay so he moved he, he came down to london and worked in that hotel and, and i remember being sat there at the age of 21 years old thinking i want to be like this guy like, i want to you know like not saying that I'll ever get to to the to the um, dizzy and heights of three stars, but just the story and the desire and the work ethic and and back then as well, everyone was the same. Yeah. You know, you know, sometimes like you hear like in in Britain that you know we're we're very quick to pull people down, whereas yeah. in America they build people up and they yeah. celebrate enterprise and entrepreneurship and stuff like that. Um, and I do really agree with that. I think that, that there is that mentality, certainly in Britain, that it is, it's very easy to always knock people and pull them down. But do you know what? I remember every single one of those teams, David Dempsey, Mark Sargent, um, Sark Simone, myself, Addy, like the, the group of boys at that time in the kitchen, we were just in awe of what Gordon had achieved. And, you know, when he got his first Ferrari, 
Yeah. You know, like, you know, he got he got this beautiful navy blue Ferrari when he got three stars and that. And there was not one bit of us that was like, we're working loads of hours yeah. and we embraced it. We want we wanted to be like it and 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 try and get there in our own way. Yeah. And certainly that was the mentality that um that I always um that I always took. And I'm staring at a book right now. Um, so you're literally in your, there's a television and you're in a big bookcase. Yeah. There's a book right in front of me called Gordon Ramsay, A Chef for All Seasons. I think it was Gordon's second or third book. Yeah. And he, he had a pile of them on the past and all prepping for lunch. And he calls us up one by one and he individually writes a message in the book and gives it to us. And, um, then, you know, I didn't, I just kind of ran downstairs, put it in my, put it in my bag and carried on prepping, you know, typical in, in the ship, trying to get set for service. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he wrote in mine, he just put dear Paul, um, hurry up and join me at the top. Um, yeah. and just, you know, love Gordon and things like that. I've always, that's their, they they things that you, you drive and, and, and aspire to and, and, you know, work and work hard. Um, and that's, that's, that's all it ever. That's all it ever is to me. You know, people ask, "Well, what, how do you how do you do it?" It's 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 just it's just work, work, working hard and and being inspired by people um, and not not sort of like you know being envious of what people do, but actually trying to be you know inspired by it and get there in your and get there in your own way. Another question for me is: It's obviously as you just illustrated, is your name above the door? But how integral? In, and I suppose this is it's obvious that the team are integral to what you do. But in your mind, you know, how do you kind of value those individuals? You know, how important are they to, to what you do? There's loads of analogies that you can give. You know, one, one one quite simple one is is I know that I I know I'm very creative, and I know that like I I can see things that like quicker than other people can. I can come up with great ideas. I'm I, I still feel good. I feel fresh. I feel focused. I, I I still feel that I've got so much more to give, so much more to bring. I don't feel burnt out. I don't feel like I'm running out of ideas. So you, you you effectively are the fire starter. Once the fire started, it needs to keep burning. Yeah. And yeah. what the team do is they they're the ones that keep it going. They're the ones that quite often, sometimes they might have a better a better idea than you do. Yeah. So you've got to bring them in, and you've got to you've got to empower them to to kind of sort of have ownership on things with you. Yeah. All right. If you if you if you become like a megalomaniac and you, it's all about you, then quite quickly in this industry, which is all about people, you're not going to surround yourself with good people because what will happen is they'll learn what they can from you and then they'll move on. Yeah. But if you can empower them and you can give them their own business, you can give them their own identity, you can give them ownership, and you can. You can say to them, do you know what? Your idea is better than mine. And I've got no problem in saying that. Yeah. And the other area is I, I, can, I can come up with the idea. I can have the inspiration for it. I can be the, you know, the innovator. That doesn't necessarily mean that I can actually execute it. Yeah. That's just the same as, you know, there's people out there that design some of the most stunning supercars in the world, but they don't know how to build them. Yeah. Yeah. No and, and that's... And that for me is, is what, you know, I have no bones about, um, you know, saying that like the team are everything. And I, if any bit of advice I would, you know, give people in business is, is, you know what, take a deeper look at your team because you know what, they're better than what you think they are. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, when I say that, I'm to, I, this is people that might, might be sort of slightly, uh, you know, it's all about me. Yeah. Whereas I, I've learned, you know, uh, you know, many, many years ago that like I don't always have the best idea, and quite often they can execute the ideas better than I can. Yeah. Now, if you can then make that a realization, if you can then empower and embody that within your within your company, within your business, whether it's a small business or medium sized business, whatever. Yeah. Like you 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 really are onto something because you know for me you know um and another massive inspiration in my life you know uh, you know a man called Derek Matt who's taught me so much about business yeah. and people 
is that business is a business is about people and certainly when you're in the in the sector that we're in you know it's about the people and it's also as well which in my game you can get very obsessed and lost in the food it's also about the office you know it can be won and lost in the office and don't take your eye off of the office and yeah. understand and, and and ring fence what you do uh-huh. and understand how the business works because if you just think it's about the cooking and you just think it's about you know you know the food that's quite often where you can come unstuck you've yeah. got to understand the, the business um living and working in cornwall it's obviously an incredibly beautiful place to 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 work and to live and i want to talk about cornwall and the bounty of cornwall in a few minutes time but how do you go about a- attracting the next generation of 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 chefs and indeed other members of the team to come to come down and perhaps leave the big smoke and come and live down in cornwall how do you do that and and make it worthwhile i suppose i think what you, what you do now is is you, you've got to use the outside more as well, and and I'm really noticing that in my own team. So many of my own team now. When I first started here, we I, we had quite a lot of like youngsters that like they just would go home and stay in their rooms, and Facebook had just become a thing, and you know, and I think what's going happening now is it's going full circle. People are really understanding that. Social media is a great tool, but it also can be a negative tool. Yeah. And, and I think I'm certainly seeing in my team that a lot of them are kind of like spending less time on, on social media and embracing sort of exercise and, and the outdoors. Now, I try to, you know, I myself am someone I, I suffer with putting weight on, losing weight. I've always got to watch what I eat. I've got to watch my, you know, my weight and that. But you know, I run a marathon in sort of 2019. Um, I've just kind of got into cycling. And I I let them know that. Don't, don't force them. Don't put it on them. But then what happens is now two of my team have gone and, have gone and got bikes. When I run the marathon, John Walton wanted to, he signed up to do the marathon the next year. Yeah. Because you're inspiring and people are and people are seeing, you know, what you're doing. So a lot of it is leading from the top. And then, you know, you, you just got to kind of put put out there that, you know what, we're a great place to come and work. Yeah. And if you're willing to work hard, if you want to live in one of the most beautiful places in the world, <laughs> not in Britain, in the, in, in the world, and you want to have that sort of 24 seven access to kind of, you know, the beaches and the, the beauty, as you say, the bounty, you know, the bounty of Cornwall and living down here, that it's got so much to offer. And someone once, you know, someone once said to me, if you can move to Cornwall and earn a London wage, you've cracked, you've cracked life. Yeah. And you pay well, you, you pay the team well. And I think that like, it's, when I was growing up, it was all about London. As a chef, there was only one place to go and uh, like learn your craft, and that was London. Yeah. Like now it's not, and and it's not just in Cornwall. You know the unbelievable outer region restaurants that there are now is yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah. And what you get with an outer region restaurant generally is is a slightly, you know, whether it's living in Marlow and working at yeah. Hand of Flowers or the coach with Tom Kerridge and, you know, or going to Sat Baines and kind of experiencing that outer region or Moore Hall with Mark Virtual, places like that. Yeah. You, you've got this actually like this kind of like nice way of life you know, on your days off and you can get out and you can exercise and you can enjoy your days off probably better than what you can, you know, when you're working in London. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's just about, you know, being very honest, very transparent and showing the next generation, you know what, this is what we've got to offer by working, you know, in the Ainsworth collection. And yeah. also you get to live in Cornwall, which yeah. now is, you know, as we can see, everyone wants to be in Cornwall because it's, it's, it's just such a, it's got so much to offer. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to you, though, as a as an individual, there's obviously there's a motivation for you that goes much deeper than business, much deeper than wealth. And I really wanted to explore kind of purpose with you and what it is aside of those things, why it is that you do what you do. What is it that you're trying to achieve? What's at the end of that? And you probably never get there. But what's kind of at the end of the road that you're kind of going after that keeps moving forward for you? It's a great question. Um, I, I suppose in the last couple of years, I've, I've really changed 
how I think. I think I had a very black and white and old fashioned way of looking at things. And I think, you know, God rest his soul. I think, you know, that maybe kind of came from my dad because I grew up in a, in a world, work your nuts off, work as hard as you possibly can and get to an age sit back retire and enjoy the and enjoy and enjoy the you know the good life yeah and it would be six years in october i i lost my dad i lost my dad to pancreatic cancer <laughs> um and for anyone that's experienced that it is it is the most brutal horrific thing you can ever sort of watch and see a human being go through especially when that person is like you know your best friend my dad was my was my world he was my you know my sort of everything and you, you kind of then look at people who don't slow down and keep themselves active because I actually think that when you are like that in life and you are kind of like, go, 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 go. And then you get to that point in your life where you're like, you think it's about sort of going on the golf course or whatever passion it is you've got and fishing and stuff like that. I don't think it works like that. And, and I really, and I really think that like, I've really changed my outlook that I'm not, there isn't some sort of end goal. Uh What there is, is trying to inspire the next generation, trying to achieve brilliant things within what we do. I was very driven by wealth and I'm not ashamed to admit that. I I wanted to get the nice things in life and Mm -hmm. and achieve achieve those things. And, you know, that's still, you know, a a driving force to kind of provide and to, to kind of, you know, do the things that I want to do, but more so than ever, my health yeah. is now what, at the age of 41, doesn't scare me, but is is, is become this, it's, it's at the forefront of my mind, Charles, yeah. all the time. Uh-huh. So what you're, what I'm trying to do is just keep going, keep, try to get better at life, yeah. try to yeah. make more time, try to, try to kind of, you know, try and spend a bit more time with my little girl, try to kind of get the balance of life right. Yeah. yeah. But actually not think that there's a point where, right, I'm going to sell everything up and we're going to move to the south of France and and I'm going to kind of, you know, go fishing or go play golf or something like that. That's that's not how I that's not how I think anymore. What what I want to do is sort of create a, you know, like, whether legacy is the you know the right word, but you know if people remembered what what we did yeah. and what we created um, was that we we did it our way and we did it we we kept it we we sort of kept it tight and didn't create a brand that was that was conceptualised by logo or by a concept. Yeah. It it stood for that wherever we were, you had a good time and yeah. and it stood for quality uh-huh. and sort of right now and lockdown one really made me sort of realize this that that we have created something that suits all pockets that suits that suits all tastes that if you're coming to Cornwall and you haven't got much money and you're staying in you know and you're you're camping and you're on a real budget we've got something for you yeah coming to Cornwall and you're and you're staying in a holiday home that's ten thousand pound a week We've also got yeah. that that high end, you know, that high end for you. And everything we do is is high end, but it's high end, but it's accessible. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you know, we don't we don't buy because it's that price point, lesser ingredients. It's all the uh-huh. same suppliers, it's all the same growers, it's all the yeah. same producers. But we've then kind of created a, a brand that people want to come and do at the moment. They call it like, you know, the, the trilogy. They want to, they want to do number six. They want to go to Regano's and they want to go to the Mariners. Yeah. Um, and, and then we, and we have people doing that who are staying in one of our, in, in, you know, one of our bedrooms. And then you have people that kind of are like, right, you know, we're not going to do number six this time, but we're going to do the chef's table. Yeah. And, and then, you know, with that, when you're doing that, when you're growing everyone in the team, um, you know, I'm really at the moment, there's, there's, there's about three or four members of the team that I'm really sort of trying to help get their first house. Yeah. Um, and so that they're, they're no longer renting. So they've got an investment. So they've got a future. They, yeah. They've got some security. They've got like, okay, this is, this is a bit of a pension. 
you yeah. know and and that's that's hugely important to me and and, and yeah and it's uh, sort of probably not spending too much time thinking about that and just hopefully making the right decisions yeah the first and foremost benefit my wife emma um and my little girl um who knows you know we you know might have another you know another sort of child one day but in that sort of short term just kind of yeah making sure health and, and the quality of life and and making the right decisions and and most you know be, being being a good person yeah. being a good person and in, in, in inspiring people and yeah and who knows who knows where the journey will go there's 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 lots of personal goals you know so yeah. you know i don't don't talk about them. there's a very clear goal for like where i would love number six to go yeah um, i'm very proud that you know i can say hand on heart whether we achieve those things or not but we at number six aren't a restaurant that's just okay we've achieved this let's just defend no we are an attacking restaurant but we're not we're not doing it in a way that is like we're trying to follow trends or yeah. fads or fashions yeah. or like well this is this is on trend now we stick to what we do but we're i suppose we're just honing in on what we do and i feel that like number six was the first one yeah so if you think number six started out in 2005 there's this massive big huge lump of like ugly rock and now in 2021 it's there's there's a shape to it and it's yeah. and it's polished and it's and it's refined and it's and it's just becoming this beautiful incredible kind of diamond and yeah. and there's still so much more to keep sort of chipping away and polishing and honing and, and getting it and getting it right and that's exciting you know that's so so exciting and then oh, brilliant there's not, I want to talk a little bit more about culinary and um, as well with you, if that's possible. And we've touched on Cornwall and the bounty of Cornwall and that kind of thing. What are some what are some of the the gems that you've found that you've come across you know, suppliers, ingredients that are offered um, within um, the county of Cornwall that you know, you've discovered along the way? Where, where, where do you start? I mean, I've got to start with the first person that I, um, you know, really got to know and set up, Johnny Godden of Flying Fish. Uh -huh. um, you know, I, 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 he's, he's a dear friend and I, and I, you know, I love him to bits and I love him to bits because he never, ever deviated away from his, from his goal. Uh -huh. And his goal, Charles, was to supply the best restaurants in the United Kingdom. He didn't go anywhere near sort of schools or corporations or rest homes or anything like that. He just went with high class hotels and high class restaurants. Uh -huh. And and he's made a very, very successful um, business out of that. And, you know, what he knows about fish and his understanding of fish and what he buys is phenomenal. And listening to him talk and and his passion for fish is, is phenomenal. And again, why he's created such a brilliant for me got the, the best butchers in you know in the united kingdom the business that they built and what they and how they built it and and the fact that they started out with a very small shop in launston that would you know the old lady would come in for a pound of mints for the cat they've never gone away from that yes they've got bigger and yeah they now supply again some of the most amazing incredible mission star restaurants in the country but the whole ethos behind um, Philip Warren's is is for you know is phenomenal. They don't just they don't just use their farm. They support the whole kind of you know cooperative of farms within you know Cornwall and Devon. Yeah. They use they only go to the best abattoirs and slaughterhouses. The, the I mean you walk around the whole place. It's it's phenomenal. And to be able to have that in Cornwall and have the relationship that we've got, you know, we go there. You know, like when we can once a week, sometimes when we're super busy, we don't get there and it might it might kind of wait a month. But we go there and we have all of the racks, the mariners racks, the number six racks, all with, you know, best ends of lamb hanging, when fallow deers are in, our beef, you know, we age our beef in tallow, all of that to be to be that close, you yeah. know, and to have that relationship is just incredible. And then you've got the the you know the smaller producers you know like um uh, a guy that we work with sean who's um you know good earth growers you know that we're we're now getting really involved mm -hmm. with and planting lots of things in yeah. the ground with him and stuff like that 
um, Ross Geach from Padstow, from Padstow Kitchen Farm. You know, again, we've had a great relationship with Ross. Davisto cheddar, um, you know, where, you know, you've got the cheddar that you, yeah. you can get in the supermarkets, but then you've got the stuff that then they'll say for the restaurants, like there's five and seven year old vintages and stuff that we use in certain things. And it just, it goes on and on and on. Then moving on to the wine, Camel, um, Camel Valley, um, Sam and Bob um, Lindo at Camel Valley. We have uh -huh. an exclusive sparkling Chardonnay at number six, just for number six. We put Camel Valley in all of our establishments. Um, and, you know, again, Camel Valley was here when I arrived and yeah, okay. British sparkling wine was, yeah. was not even a thing. And the Lindos have been doing it, you know, I think they've got to be up there with one of the first to do it. Now British sparkling wine rivals champagne, yeah, you, know, yeah. in, you know, in some areas better. Yeah. Uh, and the Camel Valley is exceptional, uh, along with so many other British sparkling wines. Um, and what we're lucky with is, and one thing I always want to make very clear to people is, what we don't do is jump on that Cornwall bandwagon. Uh -huh. Okay. Now I'm very lucky. I could probably say that 90% of what we can get into our businesses in Cornwall is, is from Cornwall. And that's brilliant. That's amazing. We celebrate so much Cornish, you know, produce, which is fantastic, but we don't, we don't, we don't use that as our, yeah. as our mantra. What our mantra is, is that we buy the best. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, what we're very lucky with, a lot of that now is coming from Britain, but we're never, ever not going to use something, not just because it's not from Cornwall, yeah, not just okay. because it's not from the British Isles. We believe in something and we're like, oh my goodness, that's one of the most amazing things I've ever tasted. And, and, it's, and it's coming from a French market. Then, so be it. If I believe in it enough and I, and I want, but then I might be giving it to you with some, you know, with a beautiful vegetable that is grown for us um, by Ross or Sean, yeah. then that's, that to me is fantastic. Yeah. But it's, it's got to be what's the best. Yeah. Okay. And we're very lucky that a lot of that is in Cornwall. Yeah. And, and that kind of leads me on, I suppose, to an, an, another question. When you kind of construct um, a dish, what is the and it might be that the, there isn't a formula but is the what is it what's your kind of journey from you know are you starting with the ingredients or are you starting have you got a vision for what something might look like how do you kind of get from actually here's a collection of amazing ingredients to to a dish how does that how does that work for you the, the inspiration comes from everywhere so you know it can be from eating out it can be from reading a Reese a bedtime story. Yeah. But I, I get very, you know, I'm a massive Roald Dahl fan. I'm a massive, you know, Quentin Blake um, fan. And like, I, I get so inspired a lot of the time by, you know, because a lot of children's storybooks are kind of food led. Yeah. And they have like, they have like nods to food and stuff. It, inspiration comes from anywhere, anywhere and everywhere. And one thing I'm very lucky you know, that I was born with it. And it was the only thing that I was good at at school. Everything else at school, I was a complete and utter failure. But the one area that I was good at was English. But the storytelling, not the grammar side of things, the story, <laughs> the storytelling. I love yeah. I love reading, reading the books and stuff. And like, and I, and I feel that creativity in me is kind of what's really helped me in uh -huh. my career as being, you know, as being, as being a chef and that. Like, I, I do, I like, I look at dishes and I understand like what I want from them, how to build them, how to layer the flavors. But I suppose the easiest way is kind of, you know, a dish, the latest dish that came from a meeting with the chefs talking about like, right, let's, let's come back with a new, new fish course on, you know, on the main courses. And I was kind of like, we've never, ever done lobster, ever, ever done lobster as a, as a main course. And then sort of straight away, just before Christmas, we were playing around with a white truffle mashed potato um, dish. I absolutely adore mashed potato. And when it's done, done beautifully, you know, using, you know, the best butter, the best potatoes, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so out of, out of that, you're then thinking, right, okay, well, we didn't, we didn't really do anything with that mashed potato idea, but let's not, let's not park that. Let's, let's, let's make a beautiful mashed potato. Actually, 
we used to, we have had lobster on the menu before, but we th- it was years and years ago. And we were almost scared to use it because it was so expensive, and we were yeah. charging, and we were sort of scared to charge the proper price for it because we didn't want to scare customers away. Yeah. But now in sort of 2021, people trust us and they believe in us and we've established ourselves and they know that we go out of our way to give you a wonderful experience. I'll tell you what, let's, let's put lobster on because you know what? It's right there, yeah. literally behind you, Charles. Like there's a wall here, like we're right on the water's edge here. Right behind you is the camel estuary. Turn yeah. left and you get to step a point and there's amazing lobsters, beautiful Cornish, Padstone native lobsters. Um, and let's use every bit of the lobster. So let's make an oil from the shells yeah. to then take the tail out, cook the tail slowly in brown butter, then finish it over coals and brush it with its own oil. Let's use the coral, turn that into a butter, and let's make a coral butter to fold for our mashed potato. And then, all of a sudden, let's make it really like that people can relate to it. Let's call it lobster, mashed potato, and onion gravy. So we'll make a we'll make a beautiful bisque sauce that's yeah. really rich in tomato and umami um, from the shells, and then we'll make um, and then with the claw we're going to tempura the claw and serve that as a second serving. So you you kind of you've got this beautiful tender roasted unbelievable piece of lobster, the most amazing mashed potato that's finished with the coral. Then on top of that, we're going to take like the onion shells, cook them in the lobster sauce just to kind of say really suck up all that flavour. Make a beautiful oil from the rock sand fire that grows on the estuary. Um, then um, some little some little sprigs of um, sand fire, some little um, leaves of sea purslane to keep the whole thing beautiful and fresh. Yeah. And then when you're halfway through this and you're enjoying this amazing course as a second serving, this tempura claw will come um, stuffed with lobster, fried in the most lightest of batters, seasoned with some dashi and some seaweed and a little lobster mayonnaise. And all of a sudden you've just taken this 500, 600 gram lobster and you've completely and utterly used every bit of it. But essentially you've kept the narrative of the dish very, very simple with yeah. lobster, mashed potato and the most beautiful, well-made sauce. Amazing. That sounds absolutely <laughs> incredible. I'm salivating here listening to you describe. So when we can, so when we can get back in the kitchen, we'll be, uh, yeah, we'll be uh, cracking on. That that sounds uh, that's yeah that sounds absolutely amazing. Listen, um, I know that um, as part of being and and living and working in Cornwall, and also outside of that, there are certain causes for you that are really really close to your heart. Um, uh, some that are connected with the industry, others outside of that. Can you just, yeah, d- tell us about some of the things that excite you, some of those kind of courses, causes that you're uh, aligned with? Yeah, um, you know, look, we'll go straight to the Corn- Cornish one, you know, is it now nearly nearly three years ago, um, you know, one, you know, a wonderful, wonderful lady, Jackie Stanley, she's, um, she's uh, uh, has an estate agent here in Padstow. And... Um, she is got she's just one of those one of those sort of very rare gems that you meet in life that has got a massive heart and she gives so much and she doesn't she doesn't tell people about it she doesn't sing from the rooftops about it she's involved in so many things and she's always been such um a support and an ambassador and, and a fan of what me and emma do um yeah. she's always been there from day one she's supported us in every business so she she called us in for a meeting and said, I've got, a, I've got an opportunity that I'd love to talk to you both about. So she told us about the Cornwall Air Ambulance, which actually I didn't really know a lot about. Uh-huh. I was, I was, it was very much like I knew so much about the RNLI, but yeah. I didn't know much about the Cornwall Air Ambulance. And they're so similar. They're yeah. not fun, they don't get any no. funding, they don't get any help, but by Christ, how important are they to Cornwall? Yeah. So, um, so she so she invited us to the to the headquarters. We met the the CEO and all of the team, and they basically said we would love you and Emma to be um, the ambassadors for Cornwall Air Ambulance. We are on a mission, and in the next two years, we need to raise two point five million pounds for the new helicopter. Yeah. Um, and then they took us out to the helicopter and explained to us why they needed this new helicopter. But. What was the most sobering? They then introduced us to again another 
unbelievable, wonderful lady called Barbara Sharples, whose grandson unfortunately died, but would have made it if they had this helicopter, yeah. or at least would have had a fighting chance if they could have got him to Bristol yeah. in time. But this helicopter, it needed to stop for fuel. Yeah. And and it just and it and it basically wasn't quick enough and she lost her grandson. Sure. So wow. when you hear that story, Charles, it's mm. absolutely heartbreaking. But also you you really understand that like any one of us at any time could need an air ambulance to save our lives. Yeah. Wherever whatever part of Britain that you're in. So it was it was it was straight away me and Emma were like, we, we want to do this. And what was funny, a few weeks before that, Emma had been saying to me, like, you know, I really want to. I really want to find the cause that we can really help and and do our bit. And and it was it was like literally this yeah. came along, and it was yeah. like, yeah, well, you know, sign us up. We'll do everything we can. So yeah, we 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 went on the journey. We did two main major functions: one here in Padstow, one here in London. Um, and yeah, with what we do as a, as a group, we put envelopes on all of our tables. We raised, we did two huge big events and yeah, we raised over a quarter of a million quid. So, um, you know, which obviously went towards, yeah. went towards kind of all of the other fundraising, um, they do. Then after that, I run the London marathon for pancreatic cancer. Yeah. Um, so I still support them in every way where I can, which obviously as I alluded to earlier, yeah. is, is 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 you know in, in honor of my in honor of my dad. Yeah. Uh, RNLI, I'll always do um, anything for the RNLI. Yeah. Um, That's amazing. And my, my last question, because much like last time we spoke, I'm I've got more questions than I have time, but um, <laughs> We talked about the future of fine dining, and I think we both agreed that there clearly was a future despite pandemic and everything that's going on around us. But how do you see that um, space evolving uh, into the future? Um, yeah, um, Charles, I, I, nothing but positivity for it. N yeah. Nothing. I mean, that word of fine dining, you know, I, I suppose I was watching the programme the other day as well, and it was, you know, it was about like, oh, you know, going to a Michelin star restaurant is really unhealthy. What, why? Yeah. How, how can it be? You're, it, that restaurant, okay, you know, some of them might be cooking, you know, more more richer products, like more butter, more fat, more more cream in that. These, these restaurants, if you want to call it fine dining or whatever label you want to put under, like, these restaurants are sourcing the best ingredients on the planet, the finest fish, the finest meat, the finest vegetables, the finest dairy, like, like anything, too much of anything is, is bad. So to me, I don't look at it as like fine dining. I don't, I look at these places is that if you, and there are millions, billions of people on plan on the planet that want to spend their money, their hard earned money, on going somewhere where the chef, the team, the front of house are working really, really hard to give you an unbelievable food experience. Yeah. And that will never, ever, ever fade out. Never ever. And the other way that you've got to, the other way that you've got to look at it as well is that when you're young and you're in your teens, you're you 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 know, you're you're doing what you're doing in life. You, you know starting to kind of have all of the life experiences that you do when you're a teenager. Then you get into your twenties and you're kind of, you're working, you're, you're, you're probably clubbing, partying hard, having a good time, doing what you're doing. You then get to your sort of your thirties where you kind of like, you sort of still kind of do those things, but you're like, right, okay, do I start thinking about a house? Do I start thinking about children, getting married, settling down, all of those things. Yeah. You start to think about those things in your, in your thirties. Certainly, that's kind of how it went for you know how it went for me but what you realize is is that how important food is yeah that it's that when you're a teenager and you're in your 20s you may not pay that much attention to it, it might be just on the go on the hoof because you, you you know you're doing what you're doing but when you get to a certain point you know in your life having people around for dinner yeah. going out with friends to a to a restaurant saying to yourself that do you know what we're not going to eat out as much in sort of these places but we're going to save up and have an absolutely unbelievable and we're going to go and see claire smith at court do, yeah. do, do you know what i mean and yeah. that and like oh my god we're so excited it's booked 
that becomes so important in your life. And then all of a sudden you realize because sort of sitting down and chatting with your nearest and dearest and having the most wonderful meal cooked for you at a, at a fantastic restaurant or whether you're cooking at home and that food becomes such a huge part of your life more than you more than you ever know yeah and so that's why i'm so confident and that's why i always knew that the the revolution of our industry was never never built on foods in now yeah. When I came into this industry, food, like high-end restaurants were just really in London. The only ones outside of London were La Malpoir, Gidley Park, Tremaine and Annie Schwab at, um, uh, oh, I forget the name, where Colin McGurran is now, uh, Wittringham Fields. Yeah. They were the only three restaurants I knew outside of outside of London that were, you know, sort of high-end. And it was, you know, it was, it was kind of more for the rich and famous yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that, but... All high-end restaurants now are super, super accessible. And what you what you realize is, is that chefs are, chefs are on television cooking food. People are so interested in this. People are, they're just so invested in it. And everybody loves to know where food comes from, how it's sourced, like how it's cooked, the techniques, what you do. Like it's become such a rock and roll industry, yeah. and then it didn't stop there. Then it then it was with the coffee and the gin, and now yeah. it's not just gin. All spirits, rum yeah. is rum is huge, vodka is huge. Like then you've got all the different brewers and beer makers and artisan, um, you know, um, brewers doing like wonderful things and all the different IPAs and ales and lagers and stuff and coffee and how people, and literally how precious people are about yeah. their coffee. Yeah. So this isn't a trend. This isn't like, it's, it's, it's a fashion. This is, this is changed forever. Yeah. And everybody in this country realizes now, and we've got amazing people um, to thank like the Rue brothers, you know, God rest their souls, you know, Albert and Michelle Rue, the, brought this to this country in the early 60s and over time it's evolved and evolved and evolved and now we're a nation that is being taken seriously for their food but Oh, Paul, as I said earlier on, same problem as before, unfortunately. We're going to run out of time and more <laughs> questions. We should make this a monthly thing, to be honest. Again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now we, you, you ask good questions, Charles. You ask good yeah. questions. That's so back, thank you so much. Um, that concludes this episode of the Food People In Conversation with Paul on behalf of us all at the Food People and the In Conversation with audience. Thank you so much for joining me today. For the second time, you've inspired us. You've made us think and you've made us smile. It's been a pleasure, as always, to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So do join our TFP community for the details of all of our latest In Conversation with episodes, as well as the latest free to access food and drink trends for site. Visit the foodpeople.co.uk and complete your details at the footer of the page. On behalf of Paul and myself, thank you so much for listening to the Food People In Conversation with. I'll just leave you with one question. How are you shifting the future of food and drink? Thanks for listening.